Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community, Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Abel Den On Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Abel Den On Air, is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists. Welcome to this edition of Able and On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. I'm on time. And on this um, edition, before we get to our guest, Mayor, Mayor Ann Watson and her senatorial bid. Uh, let's thank our sponsors, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and many others, um, including the partnership of Division for the Blind in Vermont, Association for the Blind in uh, Vermont, and today our partners are the, uh, one of our partners is the City of Montpelier, Vermont. Uh, we would like to thank Ann Watson, uh, Mayor of the City of Montpelier, for joining us again on April Then On Air. Welcome to April Then On Air. Well, thank you so much, Larry. Okay, so uh, tell us uh, more. You're going to be running for senator, and uh, let's start there. Why, um, why the Washington District? Why did you decide to expand and become senator? Or, or wanting to become senator. Well, yeah. So, uh, so the Washington County District has uh, three senators, mm -hmm. and one of them recently stepped down, um, Anthony Polina, and I um, have been thinking about making the the jump to working at the state level, you know, in the state legislature, and I, you know, just knowing that Anthony was uh, stepping down. Uh, it seemed like the right moment, seemed like the, the right opportunity. And especially because I, um, I'm really passionate about uh, a lot of topics, one of them being uh, climate action. I, um, you know, there, I've been able to make a lot of progress with the city of Montpelier, uh, but we need bigger change. And to, to, in order to make bigger change on uh, the issue of climate, I, I need a, a, a different seat. So uh, I'm happy to be uh, putting my name in for um, the Washington Senate District. Talk about the, uh, talk about the bigger change that you want to make. Now, obviously, um, being mayor is a big responsibility, even though we're in a small town. But explain the bigger change and, and you know, bigger responsibilities of that that you want to make. Yeah, sure. Well, so uh, I, I just mentioned uh, climate action. So uh, certainly being able to uh, assist folks who maybe are, particularly who are renters and being able to make changes to um, their, their spaces, ideally without having rents uh, jump up, 
uh, that's going to take state support, I believe, mm -hmm. to uh, weatherize buildings and do some fuel switching, particularly for renters, uh, to get folks off of fossil fuels and uh, carbon-based heating systems. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one thing. Um, but another thing that I am very interested in is healthcare. Uh, so I um, don't get to do a lot of work on healthcare at the city level because that's not within the jurisdiction really of what the city of Montpelier can, can do and what we can affect, uh, except for offering our, the city of Montpelier employees uh, good health insurance. Uh, so, but beyond that, it, we don't get to really affect um, the, the policies that govern it. Uh, and so I, I think folks know that there are lots of ways that our healthcare system could be better. Uh, wait times are significant right now, so we need wait more. Wait times in hospitals? Sure, in hospitals uh, to be seen at all. Um, so we, we actually just, we need more doctors and nurses and healthcare uh, facilities to accommodate that. We need to make sure that uh, prescription drug prices are not uh, exorbitant. Uh, we've been able to put caps on the price of insulin, for example, but um, that needs to happen for a host of other types of uh, prescriptions. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, ideally, my goal would be to work towards um, universal single payer uh, health care. And what does uh, that mean? Uh, I like to see no, no co pays on medications. Yeah, what about that? No co pays on, on, on medications. medications. I, I mean, I think. Um, that's something that we can certainly look at. I think what's tough is when um, the the copays are are significant, and uh, when or if if the uh, prices for prescriptions end up, you know, if the the amount that the insurance company is paying is not uh, enough to uh, to cover, you know, what would be an exorbitant cost for the um, for the person who needs the pres prescription. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, that's, uh, yeah, those are things that are absolutely on my radar. Um, and, uh, yeah, th folks should be paying, um, the hospitals should have one price that they pay for a certain type of, of, um, procedure. And right now that depends on the type of insurance that, uh, that a person has. There's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of issues that, um, I think can be addressed. Yeah. Talk about, uh, Let's talk about, um, before we get to our next questions, let's talk about the issue of gun violence. Yes, yes. Um, well, we can, at, um, recently, Ableton on there, we've had uh, Senator Rebecca Ballon on talking about that very issue. What's your stance on gun violence and how do you see it um, in your, um, in, in your stance in, you know, wanting to become senator? Yeah. Well, thank you for that question. I, as a teacher, have been through many uh, lockdown drills and uh, like active shooter drills, lots of trainings on what we can do in our, in my own classroom, um, you know, should uh, an active shooter be a, a possibility. And we even had uh, at uh, the school where I teach, we had a shooter on campus. Um, it didn't end up um, uh, that shooting must have in. Been kind of scary. Oh, it was very scary. It was very scary. I mean, uh, that that whole situation was just um, very sad. Um, but I I will say that it uh, is not a solution to have uh, teachers just doing drills. That's not a, a enough. A lot of well, okay. Since you said that, a yeah. lot of states want to give. Teachers, guns. Yeah, no, I, as a teacher, I do not want a gun. I think having more guns in classrooms. Yeah, I, don't blame you. Yeah, it, I think that just increases the risk of uh, accidental shootings, it increases the risk of, of violence, particularly uh, against uh, historically marginalized uh, uh, students, you know, students of color, uh, LGBTQ students. So I, that just seems like all kinds of a bad plan. Are you still um, going to be remaining a teacher? Uh, even as yeah, a, so if a so, I realize it's a little bit of a diversion, but yeah, if I um, am able to become senator, a uh, senator for um, uh, the Washington district, I would teach for part of the year, and I would have a long-term sub for a part of the year. Uh, so, uh, but we'll make it work. But but coming back to the question on gun violence, um, I'm absolutely for uh, 
stronger gun safety legislation. Uh, I think there's a quite a few kinds of, of laws that um, we could be and should be um, adopting. You know, I think about banning the online sales of guns, um, increasing the the age for for purchasing guns, um, mandating safe storage. Um, Th uh, things like universal background checks, um, because waiting now, periods. Because now that, now that, um, it, here's the thing with guns, and I also discussed this with Chief Pete. Um, ghost guns are a problem. What a ghost gun is is if um, if you have access to a printer that prints 3D yeah. models, yeah, you can print the gun and mm -hmm. then go on Amazon and get the parts for the gun. Yeah. And then it had, don't have serial numbers, it doesn't have thing, and that's yeah. a problem. Yes. Um, your online sales of guns, are you going to do something with that as well? I, I think that is absolutely worth looking into. I think that's a tough thing to try to regulate just because of the nature of uh, the availability of those kinds of files. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we ought to, we ought to try. Um, and. Uh, so I would be interested in working together with um, you know, experts in that field to see what can be done. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what is um, your stance? Okay. Uh, did you want to start asking questions? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, what's your take on abortion? What's I'm sorry. What's my take on abortion? Roe versus Wade. Yes. And did you hear the news today? Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, that was just. Uh, gut wrenching um, to is, hear. What is Vermont going to do with uh, legislation and and sen and senators? Yeah. And so there's um, uh, a, there's a, actually a, a reproductive rights uh, or reproductive uh, liberty uh, bill, Proposition Five, um, that is going to be on the ballot uh, this November. So the public will have an opportunity to weigh in, and I hope that. Folks pass uh, Proposition Five, which would protect uh, the reproductive liberties of, uh, of folks, and uh, so th that w is a step towards uh, a constitutional protection um, for uh, people's right to an, an abortion uh, and an abortion care. But uh, you know, I, 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 I just my heart breaks for uh, the folks in. Um, around the country that are, are losing their access uh, to abortion care at this point. Um, and I... And the laws become more stringent. For example, what if someone is raped? Yeah, and, yeah. And then also the laws become more stringent. What if someone is special needs mm -hmm. and can't think for themselves and needs a guardian? Mm -hmm. if, if their, if their um, age if they're, I, I should say, capability, mm -hmm. uh, if they're an adult, and, but they think as a child, mm -hmm. for example, yeah. if they're lower functioning, mm -hmm. what happens to them? How does that abortion rule, you know? Yeah, right. No, f yeah, no, absolutely. That's, uh, that's, it's so tough. And I, uh, I, I know, well, I'm, I, I was encouraged to hear that uh, there may be more uh, access since Vermont has some protections uh, has protection of, of abortion care um, in this state uh, that that folks are potentially ramping up telemedicine uh, which I think is going to be really that is important an issue. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, to, well particularly to help folks in places where they may not otherwise be able to uh, see a provider mm -hmm. um, so. Anyway, tough. It's a it's hard go, hard day here in here in this news. Go go ahead. Um, go ahead with more of your questions. Um, can you re okay? Can you repeat your question? Go ahead. Condoms, you mean, you mean, you mean... Okay. Elementary uh, school. Uh, okay, I'm going to repeat the yes, question. Yes, yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, um, since you're a teacher... Yes. And you've 
wanting to become senator. Yeah. Uh, what is your take on on um, on, on uh, children wanting condom, or, or I should say, in ele elementary schools now they're going to be having condom machines, or, or or like you know teaching kids more about sex and that kind of thing. You know, I think and the laws in terms of that. Yeah. No, I I take the approach that uh, we should be uh, providing uh, safety Sorry measures. Sorry if that threw you off. No, it's know. fine. I, I think uh, making condoms available to uh, to kids is important. And, uh, you know, whether... Any eight, well, I mean... I mean, uh, making them available, I think, is I think is fine. Um, so, you know, if, if uh, you know, the sex education, um, you know, at... Like at the at younger ages, I think is is um, you know done uh, in a developmentally appropriate way. I think is is fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, now let's get to let me your stance on the environment. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And other things within that. Um, go ahead. What is your stance on on the environment um, as it stands now as mayor, and then what are you planning to do as senator? Yeah. Well, so the main driver for me in being in politics at all, actually, is uh, addressing uh, climate issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so the we know that the climate change is happening. Global warming is happening, mm -hmm. uh, and it's not in some far off distant time, it's happening right now and it's an emergency and we need to be acting uh, boldly and significantly, um, basically as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so I am uh, proud of the work that the city has done. We've actually been able to reduce our uh, total energy consumption since the time I've been on the council. And at this point we are sourcing uh, about 40% of the municipal operations energy from uh, renewable sources, which I am very encouraged about, uh, but we need um, we need more help, especially if we're going to hope that the community at large is able to transition, um, as, especially for those without, um, you know, the the authority to make decisions in their own homes. You know, thinking about particularly renters, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and and also thinking about our transportation sector. You know, we have. Uh, of all the, the sources of uh, carbon emissions from, um, uh, from our, our society, from Vermont, uh, transportation is the, the biggest uh, source of uh, greenhouse gases at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so we need better transportation solutions as well. Um, yeah, so I mean, that's, th this is, I, I realize it's just one aspect of the environment, but uh, you know, I think that also uh, you know, we need to be paying attention to what's happening um, with PFAS, uh, which is an emerging... What's, P, what's, P, what's PFAS? PFAS, uh, well, so it's an acronym for a type of chemical that is uh, unfortunately toxic at very low concentrations um, and cancer-causing. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's pretty pervasive. It's, it's actually, um, when you think of like Teflon, it's, it is And certain Teflon. things, for example... We talk about lead and other things. Like years ago, a lot of people uh, became learning disabled, be, learning a challenge, I should say, because sure. of eating. I don't know if you remember. I don't know if when you were a kid, you you ate a, or bite on a lead pencil. They uh, used to do that. Well, I I knew a lot of kids who would chew pencils. Yeah, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> but but I know we're not doing that today. Yeah, but I'm just saying. Um, yeah, yeah. What what is your stance on like? Uh, uh, well, lead paint they don't really use anymore, yeah. but asbestos and all that kind of thing. Right. Well, so a lot of homes... Yeah. Go ahead. What were you saying? Yeah, noise reduction and all that. Um, uh, that's part of the environment. Oh, part of the environment. Well, let me speak to the asbestos part first. Uh, a lot of homes uh, are in Vermont have still asbestos in them. And really? Yeah, yeah. Well, and the idea is that as long as it's not uh, airborne, then it's probably fine. So you just leave it alone. Uh, but especially if homes are going to be uh, really thoroughly weatherized, that... Yeah, it's got to change. 
Uh, and so I, I think you know, folks need greater support in terms of being able to remove the asbestos from, from their homes. That's, uh, that's not a small task. Uh, so, but that, that's certainly on my radar. Uh, and then as far as, uh, as noise pollution goes, it, um, you know, I think about uh, things like, um, well, so in, in Montpelier, we have a, a noise ordinance, and but one of the things what that... What is that? Exactly? The noise ordinance? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's between certain hours of the day, basically at night, um, noise of a certain decibel level is prohibited, but there are certain um, uh, exemptions, and one of those uh, exemptions, I think this might... Uh, yeah, no, I guess it's not. I think it is um, during certain hours. But anyway, one of the exemptions is things like lawn equipment. And uh, so Burlington, uh, just as an example, has done away with uh, the exemption for leaf blowers because uh, electric leaf blowers are much quieter. Uh, and I think there we can be making some progress on, on that as well, especially now that uh, electric options for lawn mowers, leaf blowers, weed whackers all are, exist and uh, are, you know, just as effective but much quieter. Uh, I think we can think about um, repealing some of those exemptions mm -hmm. to say that this is not acceptable noise. What is your take on um, uh, now? There is. Uh, there is a lot of low-income housing. There is a lot of people that is um, that that are homeless, possibly in Montpelier. Yeah. What is your take um, in the Washington County District, being the fact that you're uh, you're running for senator? How are we going to um, deal with that? And also, as of this week, there was a big um, situation on WCAX with the college being up for sale, a uh, college mm -hmm. of fine mm -hmm. arts, uh, and the extra space. Yeah. Go ahead. What did you want? Oh to gosh, say I have so that? many thoughts on this. Um, so one of the things that. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's great. Um, well, so uh, I know that the legislature did just spend a lot of money on housing in the last budget, and I, that is very encouraging. I would love to see us uh, continue to support. Uh, additional funds for housing, and particularly going towards hum, home ownership, because a lot of Americans ha build their wealth through owning a home. And so, if, as much as we are supporting rentals, that's great, but it mostly ends up uh, building the wealth of landlords. Um, and so, as if we can be supporting um, home ownership, that helps spread out uh, the wealth. That's that's a good thing. Um, I think the state needs to be doing a better job in terms of supporting um, services for um, folks experiencing homelessness. That uh, has, I think, fallen by the wayside too much, uh, and there's a lot that, that can and should be done uh, to support that, um, uh, the folks that are in that situation uh, right now. Uh, I also, you know, just in thinking about how we can make it easier to build housing right now, particularly because just even building housing in this economy is very expensive. Uh, and food is going up and too. And food is going up. I'm actually really worried about um, the oil prices for those who are stuck uh, yeah. paying uh, yeah. fossil fuel. The what? Baby formula shortage. Ba oh, baby, baby formula, formula shortage. Shortages. Yes, and I've heard that that is coming, uh, that that's getting better, which is good. Uh, but oil right now is really um, high, and I think that's going to be, yeah, it's going to be really expensive for folks this winter. And so I, I hope that folks that are able to make changes um, to get off of oil are able to do so um, soon. Because there's yeah. other ways of heating your home. You know, Absolutely. You know, the market shortage because of the seeds. Repeat that again. A mustard shortage. A what shortage? A mustard. Uh oh, online there was a mustard shortage. What really? I did not hear about that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. There's other now. I let, said, said feminine product is on a shortage too. But but let's let's uh, also talk yeah, about the pandemic. Well, you, before before we do that, could, just bringing it back to housing real quick. One of the things I'd love to see us do is um, hold on, uh, make it easier to build in downtowns um, and especially downtowns that have zoning already with uh, 
good environmental checks on that. If, if a town, for example, like Montpelier, has good environmental checks in their zoning, um, then I think they should be exempt uh, from- What's an environmental check? Oh, so, um, you know, thinking about stormwater and, you know, environmental impacts, that kind of thing. Um, they should be exempt from Act 250 in the building in the downtowns. Because, for um, example, back in 1992, and I've done research, 92 Montpelier had a, the, a horrible flood. Yes. Where the bridges were broken and other things happened and people got flooded and people were using rafts to get to work. <laughs> um, hopefully nothing like that ever happens again, but what is going, how is the city of Montpelier prepared now for something environmentally? Yeah, so we like, do have a, a store, um, uh, an emergency management plan that lists like the resources of it and uh, basically like the procedures that would happen um, should we find ourselves in an emergency like that. But we've also since then um, taken some measures to um, to help prevent that kind of flooding again because that was caused by um, an ice jam, mm -hmm. and so we an ice jam. Explain. Oh, uh, so. Uh, in the spring, as the river starts to thaw, you know, there's a layer of ice at the top that um, starts to flow. But as that ice uh, flows, it might get all jammed up, might get packed together, and then cause flooding behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've we have some measures um, to help prevent that at this point, which okay. is good. Uh, but you wanted to also talk about the pandemic. Yeah, yes. the pandemic is forcing the environment. Now, oh, okay. during the pandemic, the city of Montpelier um, lost some people or furloughed yes. some people yep. in terms of employment. Now, the situation is um, price gouging, talking about things going up. Yeah. Um, are you going to work as district senator to um, maybe talk to business owners about how not to price gouge? Are, you, are we going to work on that? Because like toilet paper went up, food went up, yeah. um, detergent is like sky high and it's just soap. Yeah. You know? uh, so I think your question has some layers there. I mean, I I'm think- I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Like, you know, for example, like price gouging, um, at gas stations, like for example, right? That's illegal. Like that's not supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. um, now, are companies allowed to make profits uh, in you know un unregulated profits on on their um, items? Yeah, sure. Um, that feels immoral, you know, especially when it's the kind of product that people need. Um, but uh, I, I think there, and, and then add on top of that, like the supply chain issues that you know yeah, we're, we're experiencing anyway. What is, um, how is the supply? Is and, the supply and inflation. Issue, is it changing at all? Uh, well, so to, I, I couldn't say specifically. I don't know if it's um, getting better, uh, but yeah, interested in keeping a, a thumb on that to see how that's going because. You know, ultimately, like folks need to be able to afford uh, essentials, mm -hmm. um, and that's. And when you're on low income, it's hard to afford. Yeah. If a, if a person is on low income, for example, yeah, it's hard to afford the basic necessities right? of, of yeah. life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, now, um, go ahead. Did you want to ask any other questions? No, not right now. Not okay, well, I'll continue the conversation. City of Montpelier. Um, how, um, how are some of the services getting better with um, City of Montpelier and as a whole? You know, as far as you being mayor and and the uh, council. Yeah, that's a, a great question. So, uh, during my time as a city councilor and as mayor, uh, so we've. Done, we've done a number of things. There's uh, a lot I could say here. Uh, we formed the Social and Economic Justice Committee, um, and we also um, formed a, a police review committee. And so um, the Social and Economic Justice Committee did a, an equity needs assessment to Which see... Which is what? Uh, well, so to evaluate the city for uh, how we were doing in terms of... Um, uh, 
really looking at whether our procedures and practices were inequitable, like to see if, if they were discriminatory um, in any way and what could be done to make them better. And so they've made some recommendations and uh, we've actually started to implement um, some of that. What do you mean That's by discriminatory? Well, so, you know, th like, like structural um, racism or things that, um, you know, ways that our, our processes are, um, are not um, accessible to people, you know, even like particularly with, for folks that are differently abled. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, we're looking at uh, getting a new website and one that might be uh, better to, you know, f in terms of accessibility uh, for folks. So that's one thing. Uh, we also recognize that the people who are participating in uh, local, you know, committees uh, on in the city government are probably either overemployed or retired um, or, you know, wealthy enough that they don't have to be, um, you know, missing out on work to participate. Uh, and they also might not need to be paying a babysitter, that kind of thing. And so we're actually piloting a, uh, a program. To pay people to be on. Yeah, to, uh, and an as-requested basis uh, to pay folks for their time for participating in um, city committees mm -hmm. um, and hoping that that will um, increase the diversity of folks that are able to participate. Mm -hmm. So that's one way. Um, also, the, the police review committee uh, came up with a number of recommendations for us. Uh, and w so we've started to implement those, you know, thinking about, um, so we actually approved um, uh, having body-worn cameras for the police. Um, we're getting uh, better training around how to uh, what best what best practices are for um, crowd management uh, around uh, dealing with youth and um, also uh, you know with uh, with folks that are in you know having having um, you know mental crises that kind of thing. So uh, and we've expanded our, our street outreach uh, position. Uh, which is, I, I think, is well. It's it's been successful so far, so I'm really pleased to right see it about expand. Expanding sanitation within the city of Montpelier. Yeah. So we garbage cans were flowing. Yeah, yeah. So the pandemic was really hard for um, trash collection because we saw a significant spike in uh, the amount of trash that was um, showing up in in city receptacles. So we. Uh, our, we have a, a contract that has uh, trash receptacles being picked up like once a week uh, and you know, sometimes that's enough and sometimes it feels like it isn't enough mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but just in, even in terms of sanitation in general we uh, formed a, a group that is looking at adding public restrooms uh, to the downtown which I'm really excited about and we've set aside some money that um, hopefully we can use some of that to go towards um, public restrooms and um, yeah, so we, we were waiting to see if we would get some state money to go towards that, but uh, about, unfortunately we didn't. <laughs> so what about oh, so we're not having a public, we're not going to have public restroom. Well, so we uh, we were waiting to see if we would get money for that, but we have other money set aside um, that could go towards that, and so now the the committee is going to be um, meeting to discuss what ought to be done. So um, um, so stay tuned on that one, hopefully soon. Yeah, no, and, uh, in terms of, uh, we have a couple of minutes left, um, you're a big, huge um, supporter of jobs, employment, you know, for people. And yeah. you being a teacher, you're a big supporter with the NEA yeah. and, and um, the, or the S. What do they call it? The S N E A, the S. So the, the yeah. Vermont State Employees Association. Yeah. V S E A. Yeah. Yeah. V I just uh, got endorsed by them. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. So that's fine. Um, but um, people with special needs having jobs. Yeah. Or you know, because they want to be. Uh, what is your take on a person getting a job? Or, because the percentage of people with special needs is, is extremely low of people working that are um, challenged. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what um, is your take on that? You know, I uh, support folks that are differently abled being able to make, um, 
you know, whatever the the going rate is, you know, if it's minimum wage or, or more, you know, we, really we need to be increasing mm -hmm. um, what minimum wage is right now. It's not livable. It needs to be livable. I think so it's more than $15 an hour. I think it's more than $15 an hour. I think the, the time of $15 an hour is, of that being livable is past. Um, or so, because year, years ago, the minimum wage, I remember living in New York, minimum wage was like either 10 or a little less than that. Yeah. Seven. Um, especially, um, now I know Montpelier doesn't have, or, uh, doesn't have very much, um, fast food restaurants. Yeah. What is your take on, on like the fast food workers? They, they make less than minimum wage. Yeah, right. Especially so when there's you're this having a child, and you have yeah. To. So there's this exemption, exemption right, for um, service workers that particularly that get tips, because uh, the idea is that the tips are supposed to make up for that. But um, that system is rooted in racism, and uh, how, how so? Uh, well, my understanding is that it was a way to end up paying um, servers of color less, uh, and that. Um, uh, is unacceptable, and I think uh, folks ought to be guaranteed to make at least the minimum wage, if not, you know, um, more. Um, and again, the minimum wage ought to be a livable wage. Mm -hmm. um, and food service workers should not be exempt from that. Mm -hmm. um, I think or the are idea people of people taking all the the companies taking their tips and just paying them their salaries. You know, I, I think uh, the tip system is not necessarily um, a great uh, a great way to to pay people. Um, mm -hmm. So that's I, I think f folks deserve to be um, paid fairly, just like everyone else. And uh, that the the tip system is I think um, unfair and in inequitable. Okay. Yeah. With certain states having no income tax, such as New Hampshire, yeah. um, or tax in itself. Uh, the tax in Vermont has gone up. Uh, like you have a liquor tax that's like n 9 or 10 percent, and then you have a lodging tax that's a 6 or 7 percent or more. Is v Vermont changing their taxes, or is it going to go up because things have gone up? Well, that's a great question. I, um, um, if I said it wrong. No, no, that's that's fair. Uh, so I, I know this is certainly uh, of concern, particularly for the towns that are right along the border uh, there with New Hampshire. Uh, but, you know, just in terms of what's happening with taxes, I mean, I, I think about the, the income tax. And, you know, we have a governor right now who is not uh, in favor of any uh, new or additional taxes, and I think that's unfortunate, particularly f um, for those so folks who can afford it. You know, mm -hmm. you know things. Um, there's, uh, you know, regressive taxes are like like sales tax can be um, can be tough for folks that uh, you know have limited incomes. But you know, I think about the the possibility of generating more income for the state by adding a fifth tax bracket. We used to have a fifth tax bracket and then it, it's, it's gone away and I'm not entirely sure why it went away, uh, but, uh, but being able to uh, collect more taxes from the, from the wealthy in Vermont, I think, is, yeah, is the way to go. They, they pay more. Yeah. Go ahead, what were you saying? Okay. Repeat, repeat your comment. I'm sorry. The rich should pay more. The wealthy. Oh yeah, she said the rich should pay more. What's your take on that? Yes, no. There's I... a certain percent, like less than one or two percent, or the richest people in the world. Yeah. Um, do you think the? Uh, if, I'm sorry if I said. No, said no, no. Yeah. Do you no, think I... the rich should pay more? Yes, I think the rich ought to pay more. Absolutely. Uh, the uh, wealth inequality in America is uh, worse than I think people even uh, imagine it to be, and we. You think, so you think Warren Buffett and other people? <laughs> oh yeah, no, we the, the the wealthy absolutely need to be paying a higher percentage of uh, their and not income. get away of not paying yeah, taxes. Yeah, right, right. Okay, no, so 
the all the the um, you know the rest of us are shouldering uh, burdens and paying for services that uh, could easily be paid for if we had um, a better tax structure um, on the wealthy. Okay, now, not mentioning names, but uh, certain politicians get away with certain things that they shouldn't. Uh, in terms that because if a national politician, for example, you have to show your income tax, or mm -hmm. or, or your, if if a court asks you to, what is your thought on on that and privacy? With even politicians deserve privacy, but it, do you think is there changes, or do you? You think there's a law well, with that? Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, I it's not one that I've spent a lot of time thinking about, but it seems to me that uh, uh, that why it, do it, they have to show income? I'm confused. Why is why do they have to show income tax to or taxes what people make? Because um, like presidents. Yeah. Well, I think it's it's useful to know what the sources of income are for somebody. Um, I think that also helps with knowing whether, like, where there may be conflicts of interest, and that is, I think, that's important. Uh, and you know, I, there's been this national conversation about um, preventing politicians from um, owning stock uh, or their spouses from um, owning, owning or, or no, owning or trading stocks, um, or yeah. that those kinds of um, securities. So. And I think that makes sense, you know, especially if they are privileged uh, with particular, you know, information about uh, regulations, et cetera, that are going to happen in a certain industry that would affect the prices of those stocks. They absolutely should not. Um, you know, and it, it also, um, you know, I um, think about politicians that have a lot of stake in oil or um like you I know, said, fossil I didn't fuel industries. Names. Yeah, right. Uh, fossil fuel industries that you know they have an interest in those laws. Sorry, sorry. What yes. was that? Warren Buffett is one of the richest men. Yeah, yeah, Warren Buffett. Yeah. Um, but okay, talking, getting back to the environment. Yeah. Um, fossil fuels and and um, some time ago, if you remember the Exxon. Um, 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 oil oh, spills. I do. I remember and that. And that was nasty. Um, what? Wait, uh, uh, hold on. I'm getting to that. Uh, what? Um, uh, go ahead. How are fossil fuels going to change uh, with your, like I said, you, you're working on, um, so you or you will help with certain legislation? Yeah, I think we need more uh, solar. I think we need more wind turbines. I, um, we have right now a, a cap that any one off-taker can only... Um, Explain what an off-taker is. Oh, sorry, one customer. Uh, so, you know, a customer being like a business or a person um, can only have 500 kilowatts of solar. And just as an example, the city of Montpelier has uh, double that, and that's not enough to mm -hmm. cover our... Um, our electricity bill. Um, so we need to to ramp up our generation of renewable energy sources, and we need to upgrade our transmission lines to make that uh, electricity uh, more accessible. And then I think we need to support the electrification of um, of both the transportation and heating sectors mm -hmm. um, once we have renewable sources. Um, or, or maybe simultaneously uh, to um, to the renewable generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. these are. The, I think there's a number of ways to do that, um, and all of them. I, I think there's policy ways that we can do that to make it easier for folks to uh, both increase the generation and to do the fuel switching. Um, and I think there's also um, funding support that will be needed to help um, make those transitions happen. Okay. Well. We would like to thank you for joining us again on Able Did On Air. Uh, for more information on uh, the city of Montpelier, Vermont, and their website, you can go to www.montpelier.vt, or uh, actually uh, www.montpelier um, uh, uh, dash, dash yeah. vt.org. <laughs>
thank you. Uh, www.montpelier-vt.org, and there's lots of services that you can um, pick from, from uh, the city of uh, Montpelier. And um, uh, we thank, uh, uh, we thank Ann Watson, uh, Mayor Ann Watson, for joining us today on this edition of Able Then On Air. Uh, for more information on Able Then On Air, though, you can go to www.orcamedia.net. I'm Lauren Seiler. I'm on See you next time. Major sponsors for Able Then On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community, Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Able Then On Air include Park Chester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able Then On Air has been seen in the following publications, Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England Chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists.